Aaron, I'm sorry, I'm a minute late. Have you already started? Nope, you're right on time. I think it's just about time for us to go ahead and get started if you wanna kick it off. Okay, great. Well, welcome folks for coming to the monthly CPC conference. Um, I'm really pleased to, to announce that the American Psychological Association now provides CME credit for this particular conference. So those of you who are, are psychologists or training psychologists, this is, a, this is a, a very important thing. And I think it means also that there will be a slightly different evaluation form, correct, Aaron, that they will be looking at because in order to get credit, you have to actually give your name. So it can't be completely anonymous. But uh, anyway, I think it's good news that we have that capacity. And I will now turn it over to uh, Aaron. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, like Hank said, there is a little bit different of a process to receive APA credit. Um, there's an attachment in that email um, that you would have gotten in order to join today. Um, you'll have to follow the instructions there in order to complete an evaluation um, in order to receive your credit. Um, that's not required for normal CME credit, but for APA, an evaluation is required. So please do that. Everyone will be getting an evaluation after the events today, our normal evaluation. So um, please feel free to um, fill that out. We appreciate all feedback that you do have and we take those very seriously. So um, thanks for submitting those. Um, without further ado, I'll kick it off to Sammy. Great, thanks Aaron and thanks Hank. Uh, so yeah, I guess we'll just uh, jump right in. So I will start off by talking about the clinical history. We got Ben, talk about the neuro, neuro uh, psych testing and uh, Lena to talk about the pathology. So this is a, a long history. This is a man that we originally saw back in August of 2008. I think it was Roger who may have seen him first. Um, at the time, 60 year old left-handed man. And he is a, this sort of uh, a poorly described history of dyslexia, just coming from his wife. Um, but other than that, we don't really have much in terms of what that means. Um, one, but he presented with a one year history of progressive decline in memory and a change in personality. And, and his wife is the primary historian during this um, meeting, although uh, he, he did talk, but less so. Um, and she mentioned that he forgets simple household tasks. Um, he would uh, commonly forget things when he was out shopping. He wasn't very oriented to time, meaning he would miss appointments very often and not sure what time of day it was. Um, he got lost at least once when he was out driving. Um, and his wife mentioned that he was losing interest in, losing interest in some of what he would like to do. Um, and he wasn't socializing or going to movies. Uh, and he's, he had a short temper and, and while she said there was no worry about violence, um, sometimes he would be verbally abusive. Um, and he had some word finding difficulties, although at this time they weren't so bad. So he really had little in the way of a past medical history. He was on no medications at the time. Um, he was an auto worker. He worked at Ford plant and had a 11th grade education and he was smoking at the time. Um, and in terms of a family history, his father had suffered from a dementia. We don't have too many other details and passed away in his 70s. And uh, on examination, he had a, a, a pretty low score on the Addenbrook with 49 out of 100 and um, with the cutoff in, in terms of uh, uh, diagnosing somebody with dementia-like syndrome of less than of 82. And his score on the mini mental status evaluation was 17. Um, and it was really across the board, looked like he had problems um, with attention, concentration, memory, language, and visual spatial function. All right, and on his examination, really nothing there at the time, except for some of these frontal release signs. So including the snout, which is where you put a finger up to your mouth. And uh, if you're a baby, you pucker out your lips like you're gonna get something to drink. And usually we're able to repress, repress that reflex, um, but in his case, uh, it was present. And the repression of that reflex is generally somewhere in the frontal lobes and uh, no other signs of frontal release, however, including pommel mental or um, 
Well, that was the one that was actually specifically remarked on at the time. All right, and here's, uh, he had an MRI at the time, at least one, um, showing, uh, you know, he's, he's 60 years old, right? So he has a little bit, um, you can see a little space in his lateral ventricles um, and his medial temporal lobes, but actually it looks fine. Um, I, I don't think this, this was not remarked on as being, uh, uh, you know, indicative of focal or generalized atrophy. He had some scattered T2 flare hyperintensities in the subcortical white matter, but again, you know, for, for somebody of his age, it, it wasn't that remarkable. Um, and here's a coronal section uh, just showing, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of space in his medial temporal lobes, but otherwise, okay. Um, a couple of sagittal sections uh, just showing nothing in the way of, of appreciable atrophy. Okay, so fast forward now a couple months um, to October. He's back for follow-up and his wife said he, his behavior has changed even more. He's more irritable. He's had a lot of conflicts at work, actually. And, and because of this, uh, he was actually started on risperidone, uh, two milligrams. Um, and she thought it helped a little bit. Um, he had on, on uh, um, blood uh, evaluation, he, he had a positive test that was indicative possibly of, of syphilis. And because of that, he underwent a lumbar puncture, um, really showing nothing out of the ordinary. And his CSF VDRL was negative. So um, despite that, uh, he was still started on penicillin for presumed neurosyphilis, just in case, I guess. Um, and uh, because of these behavioral abnormalities, the dose of the risperdone was increased to four milligrams. And he, he uh, was lightheaded, dizzy, and he actually had an episode of syncope. Um, uh, it's possibly related to this medication. Uh, he was having a lot of difficulty sleeping at night, problems going to sleep and staying asleep. He was also acting out his dreams, and he was more depressed at this time. Um, on exam, uh, well, actually, this is just his history. His wife um, is uh, telling his history again in December now, so a couple months later. He's even uh, more behavioral changes. Now he's passive and apathetic. He's taking a lot of risperdone. Now he's on mirtazapine for depression and citalopram. He's walking slowly and he's having a hard time getting up and down out of chairs. Um, and maybe not surprisingly, he has masked faces, stoop posture on exam. He's bradykinetic, is a reduced arm swing, some on block turning. Uh, but his, his language seems okay. But, but uh, at the time the, the examination noted he, he was having problems reading. Uh, so around this time, he was enrolled in a research study, and I haven't been able to, to find the, the actual uh, images, but he had um, amyloid PIB, uh, or, sorry, amyloid PET with PIB, which showed no evidence, no abnormal cortical signal. And he also had DTBZ PET, which was unremarkable. So not, nothing, again, nothing to really... Uh, uh, sort of hang a hat on at this point. But it's important that it was amyloid negative. So next year in 2009, he came alone to the appointment. Um, his, at the time he was taking risperidone, it was reduced to two milligrams and still on mirtazapine. Um, he says he's fine. He doesn't notice any problems. Um, and on the mini mental status, uh, well, actually a, a very abbreviated mini mental status. Um, his recall was two, uh, one out of three and he registered all the objects. Um, and he was able to do the Luria, but took him a couple times uh, before he could actually uh, uh, get it right. A few months later, he comes back. He's, uh, again, he's by himself. He says he spends most of his time at home watching TV, but he's doing stuff around the house again. His wife said, um, actually, he's, he's now saying he's had auditory hallucinations for 20 years, but these have been better since taking risperidone. So these things are sort of coming out of the woodwork at this point. Um, and then on examination, he's not oriented. His language seems okay. He's able to name, he's able to follow commands, and, and now he's able to do the Luria without difficulty. 
a little bit of a fluctuation. This is why the, the history was hard to piece together with all these um, uh, reports, and it gets even better as time goes on. So two years after he originally presented, he ends up quitting his job because of his behavioral problems. He developed diabetes. He's walking even more slowly, and he's having a hard time doing new things. Um, he's now oriented, partially oriented, whereas before he was not. He gets very frustrated with these cognitive evaluations. I don't know if that's going to come uh, later with a, we'll see that again with the neuropsych testing. Um, and now he, he has some language abnormalities. So he, he has a hard time with repetition, is unable to list S words. And even though a year ago he could do Luria, this time he can't. He has a blunted affect. And now he has a sustained glabellar response. So this is where you tap on the forehead and somebody may blink once or twice, but then stop blinking. And in this case, he doesn't stop blinking. So again, another frontal release sign. And, and again, he has a, a slowed gait and he has reduced arm swing, some, some Parkinsonism on exam. Fast forward a little bit, his mental stat, he has another menis, mini mental status evaluation, 16 out of 30, very similar to what it was two years ago in 2008. He still has the same Parkinsonian features on examination that have not changed very much. Next year, he has another follow-up mini mental status evaluation, pretty much the same thing, um, and the same errors, the same cognitive domains. But his, his language it, um, appears to be a bit worse. So more problems naming, and now he has some paraphrasic errors. He is also mildly, uh, he has mild Parkinsonism. All right, so two years later, this is, I think, the last time we saw him in the neurology clinic. His mini mental status unchanged. He and his wife say not much has changed behaviorally. Um, but uh, on his exam, he has more language related problems. So comprehension and repetition now, um, but otherwise unchanged. And so here's just a, a sort of uh, progression of his mini mental status scores, um, the times when he had them uh, when we saw him really. So just unchanged, really falling in that 16 to 18 range. Now is where it gets a little uh, vague because he, he doesn't come back to the neurology clinic essentially. And he, this is all from notes that I get from, that we got from his primary care physician. So they remarked that he has this previous diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia that, um, uh, that we saw, uh, that was actually the, the conclusion from his visits in the, in the neurology clinic, the cognitive disorders clinic. But now it's gotten a little bit better. And, and actually his wife has, uh, she, she was acting as a guardian, but she released it because she thinks he's better. Um, and, but, but in the notes, when you start reading through these notes there are these uh, uh, sort of red flags that pop up saying he's, he's having a hard time with food and especially sweets. Uh, it's one of those things where if he, see food, if he sees food or sees sweets, he, he eats them. And this is particularly bad because you know he has diabetes. Um, he's driving, and uh, she doesn't have any concerns about him driving in familiar areas. Um, but he does need some help uh, managing uh, some things, including his diet and then his finances as well. So now we're in 2018. This is 10 years after originally came to the neurology clinic. Um, and his primary care said, oh, you haven't seen your neurologist in, in five years, um, but, you know, in, in theory, you have frontotemporal dementia. You should probably, uh, you should probably see them. Um, and uh, he remarks that the primary care physician at the time says he thinks that the subject is developmentally delayed, although there's no justification for that. And he said, you should really follow up in the cognitive disorders clinic, um, but he doesn't. And, and the next time he actually comes with his wife and his wife says he's, he doesn't have dementia, he just has dyslexia. And he doesn't really understand his medications because he can't read. And she's also really bothered because 
you know, the primary care doc keeps making these referrals, but he doesn't need any of these uh, appointments. So no, he's not going to follow up. Uh, and, and so I, I think the primary care doc maybe legitimately said there's more than just dyslexia going on right now. Um, I'd like you to follow up with neurology, but they never follow up. All right, and then in 2020, uh, just last year, of course, in the setting of COVID, he uh, has diagnosed. He was diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the right lung. He also has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which you know very little, you know, not very much was done about. Um, and because of the advanced stage of the cancer and and the pre-existing idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, he wasn't a really good candidate for any uh, treatments. And, and he ends up passing away uh, not much after that. And so I just, before he did, uh, you know, in 2020, as part of the evaluation, um, when they were, when they had discovered the adenocarcinoma, he did undergo a repeat MRI. Um, and so I just put the, the two side by side here to show the difference in 2008 and 2020, so 12 years, give or take. Um, there's a little bit more atrophy of the medial temporal lobes. Um, there's a lot, I would say there's more progression of his um, the T2 flare hyperintensities, uh, very consistent with you know, his history of smoking and diabetes, probably representative of uh, small vessel ischemic disease, or chronic microvascular ischemia. Um, and on the uh, um, sagittals, you can also see, I tried to get matched sections here, but I think you can also see uh, a bit of uh, atrophy in the frontal, you know, more general atrophy. It's not really remarkable or focal in, uh, by any means, but sort of frontal, um, but also some parietal and some temporal as well. Sammy, uh, uh, Hank here, is it? Fair to say that, I mean, 12 years between 2008 and 2020, in the same way that his cognitive changes were, if anything, relatively slowly progressive, that there's not that much atrophy. I mean, there's clearly atrophy, uh, but there's not that much atrophy that has occurred in the 12-year period. It's really not impressive, yeah, <clears throat> in terms of progression over a 12 to 13-year period. Um, it, it's not really that much. Um, and and you know, at least in terms of the mini over those few years that we saw him, there wasn't much change, but we, we know that's, that's not the, the sharpest tool. Um, and then based on the descriptions from his wife, very little had changed um, in terms of his memory, but not so much his personality, his language. I think we have better, at least anecdotal evidence that um, those did progressively worsen over that time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then here's um, an actual section. Uh, these are both from, I think these are both from 2020, actually, um, just showing some simplification um, and, and a little bit more atrophy in the temporal lobes. All right, so just to sum up this uh, uh, clinical history. So he's 60 when he first showed up and uh, he has a history of dyslexia and he had some vascular risk factors and he developed idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and eventually passed away from um, uh, stage three adenocarcinoma of the lung. Um, he has 13 years of progressive language deficits and personality changes. Um, and, and I, you know, arguably don't really know what the first things are, but uh, in, you know, some of what his wife had mentioned was the fact that um, he lost interest in activities. He was no longer motivated to go out and do things. Um, and she also mentioned that he didn't care about her and spending time with her as much as he did previously. And uh, there was also this language component, uh, revo uh, uh, reduced verbal output, and then really affecting multiple Full domains of language, comprehension, repetition, naming, and, and then at least one uh, mention of paraphrasic errors. He 
uh, really had broad deficits on the, the cognitive testing that we have in the notes, at least in terms of the, the mini, I would, I would really love to see the neuropsych testing, uh, but they seem to be stable at least over the um, four to five year period um, that we saw him. Uh, he had some frontal release signs on examination, um, including the snout and the glabellar uh, response. And then he had Parkinsonism on examination complicated by the fact that he was taking a dopamine receptor blocker, risperidone, um, for his behavioral issues. And then his, his MRI was not really that informative with some small vessel ischemic change, maybe some atrophy. And, and, and again, as, as hinted by the primary care physician, the, the diagnosis, what, um, what this was put together as was non-amyloid, right? Non, uh, uh, there's no evidence of amyloid accumulation. There's no evidence of uh, loss of dopamine uh, terminals. And so this was uh, considered to be frontotemporal dementia, um, not otherwise specified. It's part of behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, but there's clearly uh, some evidence of language component as well. So before um, before I hand it off to Ben, uh, any other any other questions about the the clinical history or or the imaging? All right, Ben, I think that's your cue. All right. Well, uh, Sammy, heck of a job reviewing that. There's a lot there to uh, to wade through, and I think I ultimately end up with probably the easiest portion of this, and and y'all see why. Um, so what I did was go back to the original uh, clinical report that uh, corresponded to the 2008 evaluation, um, and you know some of the the variability in what was reported. Uh, it comes back here. Um, and so some of the, the things that Sammy highlighted, um, you know, the participant had 10 to 11 years education and in the neuropsych, it said 10 years, but then it said that he completed the 11th grade. So it sounds like there was some variability there. Um, again, memory decline and personality changes at that time were said to have begun one year prior. So that would have been roughly 2007. So to Sammy's point though, things uh, obviously varied over time. And, and I think the, the motor problems as reported during the clinical neuropsych eval had only begun about five months before. Um, the hallucinations were intermittently, as I understand it, described as nondescript uh, sounds and shadows in his peripheral vision. But then later there was a note that the wife actually said, yeah, he actually has conversations and arguments when there's nobody present. Um, so that's certainly a lot more uh, well-formed. And again, those, as I understood it, were more recent onset. So it doesn't sound like there's a history of um, schizophrenia or other uh, psychotic uh, type uh, condition. Um, as Sammy mentioned, uh, history of dyslexia um, and, but, Per their report, this had worsened and he was now no longer able to read. So obviously, if, if he was able to read at some point and now can no longer do it, that's inconsistent with, um, you know, the just the effect of, of dyslexia, as you heard in one of the last clinical notes that, that Sammy referred to. So as I go through the neuropsych, I again just want to orient the non-neuropsychologists um, to kind of how we generally think about the test distribution. And as you can see, we have the normal curve here. We're in this, this range here. We account for over 68% of the pop, uh, general population, again, assuming a normal di distribution. And so um, anything basically north of one standard deviation in uh, a person who's starting out in the average range, we can think of as starting to indicate a problem. So this lower tail is where we start to, to get a little bit concerned. So when we, think about this participant, okay, we have a history of a, what sounds to be a, a learning disorder. And so not surprisingly, when we used pre-morbid estimates based on single word reading, you can see this, this red dot here, it's in the, the more moderate to severely impaired range. Um, this, again, could be confounded by the fact that if, if 
he was in fact dyslexic um, or did have dyslexia, then you know certainly his performance is not going to be as robust. And I think what we would typically do is you know, probably with somebody who has 10 to 11 years of education, who has maintained consistent employment throughout the life, I would, you know, probably tend to think somewhere in the, the lower average range um, would be a reasonable place um, to kind of put them. Now, again, Sammy mentioned that the PCP had some concerns about developmental um, delays, which doesn't seem to fit with anything that was reported in the clinical report. And so, you know, I think what we can say is that his current level of functioning was certainly well below, even if we, you know, put him more in kind of a negative one or so, or so range, his current level of functioning was well below. And I think what I'll do is just basically summarize the, the baseline evaluation from 2008, because we have a, then the participant was enrolled into UMMAP and had an evaluation just a couple of months later in 2008, returned in 2010, and uh, the performances are pretty much stable. And, and you'll see that um, I didn't feel the need to further articulate um, the lack of changes because they really start out all pretty much in you know, moderate to severely impaired range. So attention and, and processing speed, um, motor functioning, there was a right greater than left motor deficit which is interesting now that's only using the finger tapping task but the the patient is right hand dominant and so that that's kind of interesting within the context of some of the uh you know um possible louis body-esque type of conditions but again it was only motor uh, finger tapping so um have to be a little bit cautious there Visual spatial visual constructional abilities were, you know, mildly to more moderate severe impairment. Um, this is one area where I will will show you progression because I I love this uh, component of the the visual reproduction. And so this is the copy, the 2008 figure. If you guys can hopefully see my mouse, um, there should be a vertical and a horizontal line transecting this. I love this figure because I, I think it really pulls for a lot of that visual constructional processing. And you can see that actually in 2008, despite the, the performances that are well below um, what we would expect based on age um, and you know, even potentially education, overall, the construction is not horrendous. When we get to 2012, you can see that the overall gestalt, the, the larger um, square is there, but you can see that now the patient has adopted much more of a piecemeal approach and, and is, is forming each of these as individual. And I think this kind of nicely shows um, some of the more subtle. So even though the, the scores were as impaired in 2010 as they were in 2008, there is a qualitative change in um, how he was uh, performing these tasks. Uh, in 2008, um, language was severely impaired as, as Sammy mentioned, uh, both uh, well, confrontation naming, fluencies, and uh, you know, even on the token task. So language was already pretty impaired. Memory showed an interesting kind of split where for visual spatial information, it was in the mildly impaired range. For verbal information, when presented in you know, kind of contextualized prose format, the stories, actually it was within normal limits. But the discrete wordless, uh, kind of the unstructured were severely impaired. Before we make too much of this though, I do wanna point out that two months later when uh, the patient had the UMMAP eval, the pro score was much more in this, uh, you know, kind of moderately impaired range. So I think it's actually the same task um, had actually come back down closer to the other memory tests. So, um, you know, I don't wanna over interpret this initial one. It, it looks like things were good, but then two months later, um, Certainly there's, there's a notable change there. As you may have pieced together, executive functioning was severely impaired. Uh, behavioral observations, the patient pounded on the desk during one of the more complex and challenging tasks. I gotta believe it was the Wisconsin um, because we so often see that. So uh, executive functioning also uh, in the severely impaired range and the patient reported some pretty significant symptoms of depression. Um, as I mentioned, these scores really didn't change 
uh, over the next couple of evaluations. So I, I, I didn't feel the need to, to walk through those with y'all. As Sammy already mentioned, the, the unmap based mini mentals were right in that same range that Sammy showed. So it is interesting that we are seeing some pretty significant um, impairment at baseline, but really based on the mini mental, not a lot of progression. So with that, let me pause, um, see if there are any thoughts or questions uh, before we hand it over to Neuropath. So Ben, do you, do you often see that, that degree of variability in terms of the, the evaluation of the uh, memory subdomains? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and honestly, it varies. So, you know, just, um, you know, I think that the, the word lists often tend to pull for a lot earlier memory deficits, but that may also be because that's kind of the intersection between more of the um, attentional processing, the executive component of learning, and then the transfer of that information into the, the memory system. Um, and so oftentimes we see that being affected earlier on. Often, you know, I think that pros, the contextualized memory is at least off the top of my head, I, I think more consistently preserved um, relative to the, the wordless. Um, and then, you know, the visual spatial, it, it kind of varies. I, I think that um, just thinking about the gosh, the last X number of cases in the Alzheimer's Center that, that we've done consensus on, more often than not, the verbal will hang together and visual spatial may kind of be out on its own. But, you know, I, I will say that I, we don't have amazing visual spatial measures uh, that we're able to, to regularly employ. A lot of it depends on um, copying figures and if the patients use verbal mediation, um, that can kind of bolster performance. I, I, this is Hank. Um, thank you for that overview of the cognitive features. And I'm coming back to the history of the presentation. Sammy came to a doctor in 2008 because of something new or really just of something percolated for many, many years. Can you know? It, it did seem like it was, it, it was specifically changes over the previous year. Okay. And that visit, I, I believe it, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Roger may be able to answer. Better, yeah, I, I, I think this, this is somebody I evaluated. Is that correct? It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That the Addenbrooke's in 2008 is a giveaway. That right? gives it away. <laughs> <whole giveaway. laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think I, I know, I think I recall who this is. And I, I think actually the, the visit was actually precipitated by his wife's concerns, not his. I mean, that yeah, was that's, that was exactly poor Addenbrooke's performance at uh, the first visit. And it makes you really wonder where was he 10 years before then? And I, and I can't get a sense for that. Uh, what was this guy's baseline? How slowly, slowly, slowly progressive was something going on? Uh, and then I, I, don't, I don't have a good feel for that. Yeah. Well, again, I, I, my recollection is that, that I mean, his wife was concerned that there'd been a really, there'd definitely been a, a cognitive change and certainly a change in his personality. And my recollection is that was the, the biggest thing for her. And um, I think if I'm remembering the right person and, and um, I, I don't recall more than that, unfortunately. And, and can I ask Ben, uh, because, you know, the flavor <laughs> from the clinical presentation is sort of a more of a behavioral FTD-ish element to it. Uh, when you look at the neuropsych data in the end, pretty much everything is affected. Maybe memory not so much early on. What, what, what would you call it? Yeah, I think that's, I think you guys have raised some really important points that, you know, when we're looking at the neuropsych, um, just thinking about somebody who, as, as Roger and Sammy noted, the, the presenting issues seem to have started, or the, the reason was because there was the memory, what was reported to neuropsych at the time was memory change and personality change only a year ago. So the severity of impairment is pretty darn atypical of what we would expect. And oftentimes when we're looking at say the behavioral variant, we may see somebody who's early on showing the behavioral changes, but not much in the way of neuropsych. So to see somebody this impaired after only a year would be very atypical. But to your point, Hank, I think that, again, 
looking at the memory tests where a couple of the scores were actually not as severely affected as, you know, executive and attention and language, um, you know, I think it does push us away from a more typical Alzheimer's onset. And, you know, based on the behavioral changes, you, I think what we would probably infer is more FTD based on some of the, the other, the um, Parkinsonian type features with the shuffling gait, the falls, um, and, uh, you know, the hallucinations, then certainly we'd be thinking, well, could this be more Lewy body based? Um, but I think that because there were so many deficits at baseline, this would be one that I would personally kind of punt on a little bit and refer, rely much more on the clinical features than the neuropsych data. Yeah, and I, I just, I, I just want to add, I think the Parkinsonism, I'm really suspect because it, it really only began after he, he started taking the risperidone. And at least on the examination, I mean, there's the finger tapping, but I, and I don't know how much Ben, this matters, making a mountain out of a molehill, but at least in the initial note, he was, he was described as being left-handed um, and not right-handed. And, and if you saw asymmetric finger tapping with slowness on the right, um, I, I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but, but it, it was true. Yeah. So, so that the a... Parkinson on exam showed up the visit after he started taking the risper done. Yeah, so it's interesting because I mean, in the neuropsych report um, that we have, it he is listed as right-handed. But I think to your point, Sammy, the bigger question is: okay, well, would that right-handed stand out? And I would still say yes because yeah, okay. um, those norms do account for dominant versus non-dominant. Um, now, maybe the score is a little bit different if he is left-handed. Um, but yeah, just flipping through the report real quick, it does look like he was listed as right-handed. Um, so uh, yeah. I never know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Are we, are we supposed to weigh in on what we think clinically, what, what neuropathologically we think is going on before we hear the final verdict? What, what do you want us to do, Sammy? I have a thought, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Do you want to, <laughs> I think we're, we all, have our own opinions in terms of uh, what may or may not be the case. And this is why Lena, why I had mentioned, you know, I, I hope you have some answers for us because well, I think have, that- We have some answers. Is, I mean, I was gonna say, I have, I don't, I, I'm probably wrong on this, but I've seen two cases of extremely indolent, slowly progressive C9 disease um, that has kind of a flavor of, uh, frontal lobish, but not really a, you know, a classic behavioral FTD and not rapidly progressive. Um, but, you know, that's, that's all my differential, but I, I, I'm really at this point, a bit lost in terms of having prediction of what it would be. I mean, I think the, the pet is really, you know, the, the negative results on the pet in this case, I think are helpful. Very, very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone right. else want to weigh in? I guess not. I could, but it'd be cheating. <laughs> well, we, we want you to weigh in after. <laughs> Alrighty. Are we ready for Pat? Yeah. Alrighty. Just share my screen. Alrighty. You guys see the presentation mode on here? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, whoops, not letting me progress. There we go. All right, so we're gonna start with the gross photos, just kind of a warning, you're about to see some brain. Um, okay, so we actually don't have side photos for this one, I'm sorry, um, but we have good top, uh, from the top and the bottom. Um, so from here, we can see best where the leptin meninges are removed. Um, there's really not any atrophy. The, the gyri are nice and snug up against each other. There's not like it was gaping cavern for um, the sulci. And I think that's pretty consistent with what we saw in the imaging. Um, looking from the bottom up, uh, this, this is artifactual. This was an oops while removing the brain. Um, but we can see the vessels are nice and clean, um, which is surprising considering how much vascular disease he had an imaging for, for there. Um, no aneurysms, nothing atypical in the, the vasculature. Temporal lobes are nice and full. Um, again, from here, we can see there's not really any frontal atrophy. This all looks good. Um, so this is the cut sections. This is me doing an oops. Um, so there's not really much in the way of... Um, ventricular dilation, there's, there's a little bit. Normally at, at this section, 
the, the ventricles would be at a nice tight V. But we don't see that here. So there's a little bit of, um, of dilation there. Uh, the temporal lobes, the medial temporal lobes are nice and full. Um, we, if there's atrophy, the when the hippocampus shrinks, this this portion of the, the lateral ventricle is, is much larger and we can see a big gap in there and we really aren't seeing that. So um, again, consistent with not really any atrophy anywhere. Um, and and that's, on the slices, you can see that the, the gyri again are nice and full. There's no no gaps in the basal side. Um, what is important is in the brain stem, so the, this is our midbrain here, um, and this should be a nice dark substantia nigra, and this is a bit pale. So we have nice coloration in the medial portions, and then once you go lateral, it just kind of fades out and gets dispersed. And then our locus ceruleus, um, again, pardon my cut here, um, is, is pretty much non-existent. We just don't see it. So we have pallor of the substantia nigra, the, the locus. Um, so summary of the gross findings, we have a weight of 1361, which is normal. Um, no significant atrophy, no vascular findings, but we do have moderate uh, depigmentation of the substantia and the locus ceruleus. Um, and so here's our um, alpha synuclein. And so I took a few photos on the um, H and E. So we've got a nice Louis body in here. This is like a classic textbook one. It was nice to find in the case. And then this is one in the amygdala. And then the alpha synuclein up here um, is, it shows that that highlights them even more and brings out even more than we can see on the, the H and E. I did not find any in the parietal lobe. They were just too hard to find in the cortex. Um, and so in the microscopic, we described Lewy bodies in the uh, brainstem, in the limbic region, as well as in the neocortex. And so the way that we um, categorize these or, or diagnose them um, is we, we say Lewy body disease of what type and where, where it's mostly located. So it can be either brainstem predominant, limbic or diffuse neocortical. And then we grade these regions based on how much, uh, how many Lewy bodies we see. And then our grading scale is zero to four. Um, and then we just follow the chart essentially. And so this guy with neocortical disease, we were able to get to diffuse neocortical. And so that the top line or the Lewy body portion was Lewy body type pathology, diffuse neocortical subtype. Um, based on that criteria. And so uh, this is a section of the hippocampus. I don't know how well that shows up for you. So here's our hippo here, um, well here, and then our granular layer here, this is CA4, three, two, one, and then subiculum, tra transentorhinal, and terminal. Um, and so this is on H&E, &E, found some really nice tangles. You can see these um, like dense bundles of, of material. Um, this is a normal neuron and what the cytoplasm should look like. And then this is a nice tingle. Um, and so this is tau just on low power and you can see how much tau there is aggregated in here as well as through the um, enterinal regions. Um, and so the, on the micro, we described tingles seen in the hippocampus, the enterinal cortex, um, but not inv involving the medial temporal lobe, which would have bumped it up in broccoli. We'll cover that in a, in a moment. And um, as seen on his, his imaging, the, there was absolutely no beta amyloid. It was completely in any different whole sections. We stain all of them for beta amyloid. We don't trust our, our H and E diagnosis on that. And so for Brock staging, Brock staging uh, covers the um, pretty much location uh, that we're finding tangles in. And so for this guy, we were um, in interrhinal. So through here, um, once it covers here, it goes to four. So with this guy, we were at three. Um, and so with the absence of beta amyloid and having tau pathology, we are at primary age-related tauopathy, and the requirement for that is the absence of, of uh, beta amyloid or very low uh, foul phase. Um, and so since he had none, uh, it, it is definitely part, um, and we're able to attribute those findings to part, and then his rock stage is three. So the final on that is part definite Brock stage three. And that's our diagnostic criteria for that. Um, and then also found um, on his tau staining, uh, just in the medial temporal lobe, uh, this is in the white matter. You can see the oligos interspersed through here, but these are astrocytes with, um, with tau staining in them. And so they're, they're these blunt processes within the astrocytes. Um, so we find it in the white matter as seen here, and uh, sub peel. So this is a, the peel 
surface, and then we're seeing these astrocytes. That's a nice full astrocyte with tau. Um, and so only in the medial temporal lobe in the white matter and subpeal regions. And so our grading criteria for that or diagnostic criteria for that is uh, location. So subpeal and white matter as shown, and then anatomical distributions. This was medial temporal lobe. Um, and then the severity, so ours was focal. And then step four is kind of more just a research basis and that's covered in here. And we didn't break that down entirely. We just went through the diagnostic screening of one through three. Um, and so that total is uh, our tag or age-related uh, tau astrogliopathy, uh, subpeal and white matter, specifically in the medial temporal lobe and focal. Um, and that's all the pathologic findings. So I guess to answer your question, Sammy, um, it would be Lewy body uh, pathology uh, that would be yeah. the most contributory. I mean, our tag, we don't really know um, clinically what the significance is and parts is also kind of vague. So but, I think but there the was no explanation. So Lena, there, there was, in terms of the cortical Lewy body burden, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't, it, it was primarily within substantia nigra Right, and, and midbrain, but how much of it was there in, in the, yeah. The photo I had was pretty much, it's it's not a lot, yeah, but right, it's there. Right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's enough to, to ping yeah, up on so, our grading. Mm -hmm. I mean, four Lewy bodies in a field is is pretty good. Yeah, so so if I, well, I think Sammy good. mentioned this. Pretty good means uh, extensive, is that what you're saying? Counts as severe for our, uh, our grading criteria, four or more in, in a single low power field. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think Sammy, you mentioned that his DTBZ, DTBZ PET was supposed to be negative, correct? I, I just confirmed with Kirk yesterday, yes. Oh, okay, ah, yeah. now that would be, that, that would definitely be discordant with the pathology and that would be definitely unusual in our well, experience. When was that done? Well, it was, that would have been done around 2008, 2009. Am I remembering That's this right. correct? That's right, that's funny, yeah. it was in the study, yeah. Yeah. We have, I have seen, well, you know, Bob Kepi and I reported um, a case, this is quite a few years ago, of an individual was in one of our imaging studies and who had very modest DTBZ changes. And then within a couple of years, it's just like he fell off a cliff. He developed severe Parkinsonism. And I've always wondered whether or not there might be a threshold effect where, you know, you, you have some, you know, some pathology and then all of a sudden it progresses very rapidly but we, we should go back and this is interesting very interesting actually can i ask uh yelena mm -hmm. andy any other pathologists want to weigh in um when you have an amyloid negative brain of someone in their 70s or 80s how often are we now finding part or rtac is it really really common do you think that's more of a question for you <laughs> um, is, is it really, really common? I don't know that we've quantified it. I, you know, the, the, um, the, the cohort of patients that I've been looking at through the Alzheimer's center is a skewed cohort. So they're all demented, <laughs> you know, we don't get a lot of cognitively normal yeah. individuals. Um, I would say, um, there are, it, it's not uncommon for sure. Yeah. Um, it, at least for, you know, some tau pathology will be there. Um, and um, so, so I think that's fair. I think that part is more common than our tag, um, but our tag is not a rare finding. And it's just one that <clears throat> they're, they've developed criteria for that, uh, that should be, so we report it you know, there are other pathologies that are probably not that uncommon also that we we don't report out, you know. Right, uh, right. Polyglucose antibodies. I don't know if you're, you know, if you're passionate about the role that those play in disease, we haven't, there's not a criteria that we use to, to quantify those. Okay, thank you. Can, can I ask too, so in, in terms of the tau pathology, right? It, you know, clinically we're, we're spec, suspecting like an uh, uh, FTD and and there's there's tau pathology in some of the medial temporal lobe structures so what you know in terms of FTLD tau versus part how do you how do you sort of um, discriminate those 
Yeah, so I, I would want to see um, disease in the, to call it FTLD, I'd want to see it in the frontal cortex and in the temporal cortex. And here it was in the, you know, medial temporal lobe structures, but they're all limbic structures. So I, I think that um, you would expect to see a much more diffuse tau burden, particularly in the neocortex, whereas here it's really limbic. So it's the lack of cortical involvement. Yeah, um, yeah, and we also look um, in the frontal lobe, amygdala, and hippocampus for for TDP pathology. Yeah, I was is, just going to uh, ask you. Yeah, you know, and that's another one where where it's sort of like, how do you know if it's if it's FTD or if it's or if it's limbic uh, TDP encephalopathy. Um, you know, and that, so that was, that's another one where it's, it, it's a, that, that one's even murkier, I think, in terms of how do you draw the line, but, but, but there wasn't pathology. No, no. That, was, that was phospho TP, yeah. We, we have both. I, I don't know when this case came through the lab. So yeah. more recently we've been doing the phospho TDP, but I'm not sure. Lena, do you, do you know offhand if it was total or phospho that we stayed for? Uh, phospho, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm wondering in 2008, um, how extensive the neuropathology was in the brain. I mean, we already had a significant cognitive deficits that were substantial based on Roger's evaluation with lots, without evidence of real Parkinson's at that time. So I'm, I'd be really love to know what his brain actually looked like in 2008, where he was cognitively significantly impaired. And yet it's highly unlikely that the neuropathology was um, close to as extensive as we see in the, in the actual final. Yeah. Well, you know, there is, the, there is that small subgroup of Lewy body patients who have, you know, at autopsy have very little midbrain pathology and do have a lot of amygdala pathology, for example, and are unquestionably demented. So this is kind of, this would kind of be the reverse BRAC model. Instead of the pathology rising, it would be the pathology <laughs> sinking, as it were, right? Yeah. 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 Doesn't fit the model very well. No. <laughs> All right. Well, interesting. Thank you all. Yeah, that's very good. Learned a lot. Any more questions? Y'all set? Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for attending. You'll be getting a follow-up email in your inbox. Our next CPC date is not until September 10th. Um, we've moved the conference to four times a year. So um, you have a break from us from the summer, and we'll see you in the fall. Um, but thanks so much, and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, presenters. Bye.